Well, good morning, and we are so, so very happy to have you to tune in and join us for worship at Lee Chapel AM Church. Welcome to our 10 a.m. worship service on this wonderful Sunday morning. Uh, we have come off of a wonderful week. We praise God for what he's done for us this week. Again, we praise the Lord because this is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Of course, we also want to acknowledge this is the day that we take time to honor uh, the fathers and father figures in our lives. And so we'll be having a special tribute to those fathers uh, in our worship service. But we certainly want to set our hearts and minds right now to focus in on God, our Father. So let us get our hearts and minds focused. Let us center ourselves. Let us prepare ourselves for worship. Let's prepare ourselves that the Spirit of God move into our hearts and minds and allow the Lord to bless us as only He can. Amen? All right, let us uh, open up as we usually do with our call to worship this morning. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for you do I cry all day long. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. For you, in the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. For you are great and do wonders through you alone are God. Amen. A call to worship is always a wonderful thing to get us into the spirit of worship to allow us to uh, be able to hear God's voice throughout our worship experience. We praise God for that. Uh, next, we'll have our preface, uh, our summary of the Decalogue, and our Apostles' Creed. All that dwell below the skies, let the Creator's praise arise. of Christ our Savior when he was asked what is the greatest commandment and he said to him you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all of your mind this is the first and great commandment the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets I believe in God the Father Almighty the maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitting on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's always good to be able to reaffirm our faith with our Apostles' Creed to be able to remind ourselves of God's commandments to us to treat ourselves right, also treat our neighbors right, and to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So now we're going to come to the moment of worship service where uh, we'll have our morning prayer. This is a wonderful time for us to not only go in prayer and let the Lord know what our particular uh, needs are, but also to listen to God. That's the beauty of prayer. We communicate with the Lord. We open our ears to hear his voice. We open our hearts to receive his message to us. But also, if we have issues in our life, it gives us a chance to uh, put those before God's throne. So let us go into our morning prayer at this time. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you, God, for watching over us last night as we slept. We thank you, God, for covering us this morning, Lord, as you woke us from our slumber. We thank you, God, for even the difficult days we've had as you've been with us in those difficult days. We thank you, God, for improvements of health. We thank you, God, for giving direction to those who were lost. We thank you, Lord, because you are our creator. You are our sustainer. 
And we come, oh God, this morning, thanking you for everything you've done for us, Lord. Thanking you, God, for blessing us in the way that only you could, Lord. And so we come, oh God, with a gracious heart. We come, oh God, with an overflowing spirit of thanksgiving, God, because we know that if it had not been for you on our side, we would indeed be lost. Our prayer, oh God, is that you would continue to be with us as we worship you this morning. Continue, God, to fill our hearts with praise. Continue, God, to fill our mouths with worship. Continue, God, to fill our minds, oh God, with remembrances of how you have indeed blessed us. Allow us, oh God, to worship you in spirit and in truth. It is our prayer in your son, Jesus, the Christ's name. Amen. 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 It is now time for our morning scripture. Our Old Testament scripture will be coming from the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 20, verses 7 through 13. Jeremiah, chapter 20, verses 7 through 13. And I certainly invite you, as always, to return with us in your Bibles. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And I invite you to read along with us as we read our morning scripture. Jeremiah 20, verses 7 through 13. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed, and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evildoers. We praise God for our Old Testament scripture reading. Uh, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 20. Our New Testament scripture reading comes from the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter number 6, verses 1 through 11. Romans, chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. And once again, I invite you to turn with us in the book of Romans. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I invite you to read along with us as we prepare to hear God's word from the New Testament. Starting with verse 1. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless the readers, hearers, and doers of his most holy word. Amen. Well, it is indeed Father's Day, and we have a wonderful special tribute prepared for you. Uh, we, we bless God for the fathers and father figures in our lives. And this is just our way of saying thank you to all of them in our lives. It is now time for our Father's Day tribute. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It must have been cold there in my 
our shadow To never have sunlight On your face You were content To let me shine That's your way You always walked A step behind See, I was the one With all the glory While you were the one With all the strength Yes, you Only a face without a name I never once heard you complain no, 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 no. Did you ever know that you're my hero? You're everything I would like
wonderful tribute again to the fathers and father figures in our lives. We praise God uh, for them, for so many things they've done for us. Amen. Uh, we thank the Lord for them indeed. Now we, we will have a selection from our choir. After that, we will have our sermon for today. Yeah. 
certainly praise God again for our choir providing us such wonderful music to prepare our hearts and minds for our sermon this morning. We thank you for ushering us into the presence of the Lord. Well, our scripture text this morning uh, is going to be coming from the ninth Psalm, verses 9 through 20. And again, I invite you to turn there with me to Psalms 9, verses 9 through 20, as we prepare our hearts and minds for our sermon for today. All right. Starting with verse number nine, again, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Let us hear the word of the Lord. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the peoples. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See what I suffer from those who hate me. You are the one who lifts me up from the gates of death so that I may recount all your praises and in the gates of daughter Zion rejoice in your deliverance. The nations have sunk in the pit that they made in the net that they hid has their own foot been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall depart to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor perish forever. Rise up, O Lord. Do not let mortals prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are only human. Amen. We praise God this morning for his word that reminds us of his faithfulness to us. Let us pray before we get into our sermon. Gracious God, we thank you once again for the chance to come to you. We thank you, Lord, for the chance to sit at your feet and to hear your word. Bless us now, God, and allow your word to transform our hearts and minds to be receptive to receive your word. But more than that, oh God, allow us to be different after we hear your word today. This is our prayer, oh God, in your son, Jesus, the Christ's name. Amen. All right, looking at the ninth Psalm, verses 9 through 20, on this Father's Day, we want to focus on this uh, sermon title for our Father's Day message. Safe in His Arms. Safe in His Arms. Any child who has ever had a father or a father figure in their life would oftentimes look to them as a source of safety. Mothers are traditionally seen as nurturing and their love certainly is evident. But fathers are oftentimes seen as a source of protection and for safety. And on this Father's Day, we want to pause and acknowledge the role that fathers have played in our lives. And even if some of us did not have fathers in our life, but had father figures, when we had an uncle or a grandfather or a neighbor uh, in our life, we, we recognize what role they played in our lives. But all of us have a heavenly father. All of us have God, our father, in our lives. And we can experience our heavenly father's blessings and his safety and his protection every day of our life. And as life challenges us with difficulties and trouble, we each look to God for our safety and we're reassured that he will always be there for us. And so David gives us three reminders about how we can indeed be safe in our heavenly father's arms. Our first point, our first reminder is this, our father will protect you. Our Father will protect you. Uh, verses 9 through 10 say this simply. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you, O Lord, for you have not forsaken those who seek you. From the very start of humanity's existence on earth, it has been apparent that fathers could provide protection to the family. The Bible illustrates this through recall stories of fathers searching out land for the family to live and even finding food for the family, whether it was killing animals to protect the family or even finding an animal as a source of food for the family. What we saw was the father protecting and also supplying for the family. And in school, in our classrooms, uh, we learned about the early civilizations where they had what they called hunter and gathering communities, where the fathers were sent out to hunt the fathers were sent out to gather supplies for the family. This particular role of the father was consistent with what the biblical narrative shows us, that fathers were the protectors 
and those who provide safety for the family. And the truth be told, if we look at God, our Father, that is what he has been, always will be, and is in our lives. God is our protector. He is our Father. He is our safety, and he is our shield. And look at the way that David particularly begins to describe our Heavenly Father, a stronghold for the oppressed. Certainly nobody wants to be oppressed. Nobody wants to be somebody who is under oppression and is having to deal with people who aren't treating them right. But notice what David says, God, you are a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And David could particularly speak about the protection of God because he experienced it himself. David was one of many sons of his father. But one day the Bible says uh, that uh, Samuel came along to find the new king that God was going to anoint. And he went through all of the sons and did not find the one that God had for him until they ran upon David. And soon after David was anointed to be the king that God wanted him to be, he was ushered into battle with this giant called Goliath. This huge giant of a man was one who was a great warrior and always struck fear into people. Well, as David's about to go into battle, everybody wants to put on this armor for David to wear. The armor was too big because David was not that size of a man. And David shrugged off that armor and went ahead and was about to go into battle with Goliath. He went into battle confident that God was going to be his protector. As a matter of fact, David said to everybody, who is this uncircumcised Philistine when it compares to the power of God? That declaration by itself was one which David was saying, God is going to be my protector. God is going to be my stronghold in this time of trouble. But more than that, David also experienced God being a stronghold protector when he was later on having to run for his life from King Saul, who he was supposed to be helping. And David saw God as a stronghold and a protector because every time that Saul tried to kill David, he was unsuccessful. Every time that Saul tried to harm David, he was unsuccessful. And David is speaking to us today to remind us that whatever we find ourselves in trouble, where we might find ourselves in a situation that we are being oppressed, God is going to be our stronghold in a time of trouble. And let me still speak to these particular dangerous times and odd times we're in right now, as it seems as if our country is trying to reconcile many, many years and centuries of racial injustice in our country. We as children of God know that the color of our skin is not an indictment upon who we are. We as children of God know that our skin is beautiful, it is black, it is brown, and God is our protector. Because if it had not been for the Lord on our side, we wouldn't have made it through the Middle Passage. We would not have made it through slavery. We would not have made it through Jim Crow. And we would not have made it through the civil rights struggle. But because God was on our side and because God was protecting us, because God was our stronghold, because God was there with us and because God is still with us, I have confidence and I want you to have the same confidence. Don't worry about what you see on TV. Don't worry about what folks are saying negatively about black lives. Black lives do indeed matter. They matter to God because God has brought us through all these difficulties in our life. And although we have been oppressed for many centuries, God has still been with us. Otherwise, we would not be here today able to declare God goodness in our lives. And so I want you to rejoice in that fact that God, your father, is indeed your protector. God, your father, is indeed your stronghold when those people would try to oppress you. And I don't know what trouble you may be going through in your life. I don't know what difficulties you're facing uh, this week. I don't know what you faced last week, but I guarantee you, God was with you in your difficulty because God is your protector. You don't need to look any further than what God has done for you in your life. Make no mistake about it. You didn't get out of your trouble on your own. I didn't get out of my trouble on my own. It was God, our Father, who was protecting us from dangers seen and also from dangers unseen. 
God has protected us from things that we didn't know were coming our way. God has held back things that were coming our way. And I praise God this morning for the fact that God has been my protector and the fact that he's been your protector because this is the promise we have from God, that he will protect us, he will shield us. And so I thank God this morning and I want you to join me in thanking God this morning. I want you to join me in praising God for the protection that he's provided in your life. Maybe it was your child that found themselves in a situation they shouldn't have been in and God protected them. Maybe it was yourself that found yourself in a situation, but God protected you. Maybe it was a mountain you needed to move, but God moved the mountain you could not move. These are instances where we can remember that God has always protected us and we can rejoice and we can glory that we are safe in our Father's arms. We are safe in our Heavenly Father's arms because He gives us that comfort. He gives us that protection. He gives us uh, that assurance that He is our stronghold. Well, some may say, well, what is a stronghold? It is exactly what the words say. No matter what pushes up against it, no matter what presses up against it, it is going to hold. It was like running home to make sure you got safe. When we got safe in our Father's arms, we knew that nobody could hurt us, nobody could harm us. And I rejoice this day, and I want you to be glad also that God is your stronghold, that God is your protector. So don't worry about the troubles of this world. Don't worry about what folks may say about you. Don't worry about the schemes of the enemy. As long as you are in your heavenly Father's arms, you will indeed be protected. And I know for a sure thing that God has brought you from where you were to where you are now. And God wants you to be reassured that whatever troubles you have in your life, he will be for you in those difficult times. We can read our Bible and see that not only did David experience God as a stronghold, but also a man named Moses experienced God as a stronghold. God knew that he wanted Moses to go back to Egypt and to free his people, but Moses didn't think he could face Pharaoh. And so God had to reassure Moses, I am going to be with you. And so Moses asked the question, well, Lord, when I go back, who should I say has sent me? He said, listen, say I am that I am has sent you and tell Pharaoh, I said, let my people go. That's a powerful statement. When God says to Moses, you tell Pharaoh that I said to let my people go. In other words, what God is saying to Pharaoh is, these are my people. These are not yours, and I'm going to be their protector. And so I want you to remember that, that whatever in this life you face, God will be your stronghold, God will be your protector, and God has not forgotten about you. God has not forsaken you. And we see that most evidently in verse number 10, that God will remind us of his protection. And I want to be very transparent with you. Uh, not too many years ago, I was going through a very difficult time in my own life. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to get out of this situation. And as I was earnestly praying to God about my situation, God asked me this simple question. He said, Harold, when have I ever promised you something and I didn't do it? And that struck me to my core with gladness because God was saying to me, do you think that I would take you this far to leave you? And so I want to ask you the same question. Ask yourself this. When has God promised you something and he did not do it? When has God said he's going to do something in your life and God did not keep his promise? Well, here's where we remind ourselves of God's promise to not forsake us because God is making promises to you today that he will be with you. God is promising you today that he will be your stronghold, that he will be your protector. You'll be safe in his arms and God has always kept his promise to you. Do not let your situation and do not let Satan convince you that God is not going to protect you. I assure you, look into your own life and you will see that every time that God has promised you something, he has kept his word. And I praise God this morning for his protection. I praise God this morning for his safety. And I praise God this morning for his faithfulness, not just in my life, but in your life also, because God has kept his word to you. Amen, somebody. We thank God right now for what he has done in our lives. The second thing uh, that God says to us, uh, that David points out, is that God, our Father, will avenge you. God, our Father, will avenge you. Verses 12 through 13 say this very simply. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See what I suffer from those who hate me. You are the one who lifts me up from the gates of death. The second thing that David says is that when we are safe in his arms, 
our Father will respond to our mistreatment. Any one of us can get caught up in trying to get someone back for what they've said or what they've done to us. We don't like to admit that. We don't like to talk about it. But if the truth be told, any one of us at any time when we are treated poorly, when we are treated bad, can find ourselves thinking of something to say or something to do to somebody who's done us wrong just because we want to let them know that they cannot do that to us. And the danger of that is that we go down the slippery slope of falling into the trap of being like them. And so what God says to us is this, don't you get caught up in trying to avenge yourself. Don't you get caught up in trying to pay back evil for evil. Don't you get caught up in trying to get somebody back and be very careful even in your words. Be careful in what you say. Uh, just this past week in, in the uh, House of Representatives, we had a going back and forth where somebody would say something and then somebody else would pop up and somebody would say something back to them. And what we found ourselves doing was everybody had to get in a little bit. Everybody had to say something. And I watched in amazement how my colleagues allowed themselves to get caught up in it. And somebody asked me, said, well, Harold, how'd you stay out of it? I said, because I ain't got to worry about this situation. I knew that God would avenge me. I knew that God would speak up for me. Yes, I let some folks know I was displeased with what they said to me, but I didn't worry about trying to figure out how to get them back. And so what God says to us also is this, be very careful and not allowing yourself to go down that slippery slope because very often we get so upset, we get so frustrated because people do treat us wrong and they treat us wrong for no fault of our own. They treat us wrong because of how we look. They treat us wrong about what because of our last name. They treat us wrong because of who our family is. And some folks just treat you wrong because they're just mean. But God says to us in his word, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And that's one thing that David realized also. David didn't have to worry about Saul because he knew that God would take care of Saul. David knew that every time that Saul tried to trick him, that Saul tried to kill him, that Saul tried to chase him down, every time that happened, God was watching. And so David was reassured that even though it didn't feel good, God saw his pain. And I know it's difficult. I know it is hard. Trust me, I know, because it's hard to bite your tongue. It's hard to allow folks to do things to you and not respond. It is very hard, but I want to reassure you this morning. Don't you worry about people mistreating you because God will avenge you. You are God's child and God will not allow somebody to mistreat you. You are his child, and God will not allow someone to do you wrong. Put your trust in God. God will not forsake you. Put your trust in God. He will avenge you. Notice what God did to King Saul. He avenged David, and God had someone else to do to Saul what David should not have done, and David's hands remained clean. Look at what happened with Pharaoh. Moses did not have to do anything to Pharaoh. God took care of Pharaoh. And for all the Pharaohs in our lives, I want you to be reassured that God will respond to them, that God will get our justice, that God will make sure that we get our situation straightened out. Because what God wants us to do is not allow ourselves to sink into that place where they are. Because you think about it, it takes a whole lot of evil to treat folks wrong. It takes a whole lot of evil to talk bad to people. It takes a whole lot of evil to mistreat people who are innocent. And so what God is saying to us, I don't want you to be like them. Let me deal with them. I don't want you to go down to the depths of evil. Let me deal with them. And I stand here today to say to you, don't let people draw you into their evil. Don't let people draw you into their way of thinking. Don't let people draw you into an argument of words. Let God deal with them. Let God avenge you. And that's the safety we have in his arms, knowing that God will fight our battles, knowing that God will go out there and get our justice. And so we rejoice today in the fact that we know, even though we may suffer for a little while, God sees all this and God knows what we're going through. And I want you to give God praise this morning for the fact that you know that God will avenge you, that you know that God will seek your justice that you know that God will set things right in your life. You should have evidence from your past 
that when somebody did you wrong, God got justice for you. You should have evidence in your own life that when somebody mistreated you, God made a way for you. You should have evidence in your own life. And if you don't, just keep on living and I guarantee you, God will show you justice. Just keep on living and I guarantee you, God will set your situation right. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't speak up for ourselves. This doesn't mean that we don't point out when evil is going on. No, what this says is we speak out against evil. We speak out against injustice. And, but we speak out knowing that God has our back. We don't let folks get us to the place where we do to them what they did to us. We speak out and we call out injustice. We call out injustice in our criminal justice system. We call out injustice in the educational system. We call out injustice in our housing system. We call out all these injustices. We call out injustice in politics. We call out injustice in all the things that go on in our world. Yes, we challenge the mayor to make a budget that meets the people's needs. Yes, we challenge the governor to put together a budget that addresses people's needs. And yes, we call out the legislatures to address things, to, to uh, get racism out of our country. We call out these things, but we call them out knowing that God is on our side. So in your workplace, if you're being treated wrong, it doesn't mean you stay quiet. It means you call out the injustice but you don't let them get you to a place where you're arguing with them. It means you point out the injustice in your situation and you make sure that things are done right. If your child is being treated wrong in school, you speak up and you call out the injustice, but don't you get into an argument with the teacher. You just go ahead and speak your truth and allow God's justice to prevail. I remember years ago, it sounds so crazy now, but years ago when I was in middle school, I had a teacher that refused to give me the, the words for a spelling test. And it was just so awful because I'd missed the class to go to rehearse for a play. And the teacher refused to give me the chance to make up my assignment. Well, my mother tried to get the teacher to cooperate. She refused to cooperate. My father tried to get the teacher to cooperate and she refused to cooperate. So we prayed about it and we asked God to move upon the superintendent's heart. And we soon found that same teacher came to me and said, hear the words for your uh, uh, spelling test. Yes, I was frustrated. Yes, I was mad, but I was not going to allow that teacher to draw me into being as, as inconsiderate as she was. My mother didn't allow the teacher to draw her into being as inconsiderate as that teacher was. My father also, and what we found was God was getting justice for us and God was making sure that we were taken care of. And so I say to you, let God fight your battles, call out the injustice, and yes, God will avenge you. Point out the injustice in our society and God will be, again, avenge our injustices. Amen. All right. Our third thing uh, is that our Father will restore you. Our Father will restore you. David's third point says this very simply, and it's a reminder of how God can restore us. After protecting and avenging, there's a need also to restore us. Restoration is always important because it allows us to be rebuilt and move more confidently in the path that God has for us. When we go through a day or a week or a month when we have resisted temptation, when we have not sought to avenge ourselves, when we have not sought to return evil, food, it can be draining and it can wear us down. It can get us to the point where we are tired and we are worn, but God is there to restore us. And as any good father knows, God knows what we need, and restoration is always a great and wonderful thing. Just look at Job as an example of how God can restore somebody. We all know the story of Job about how he had his children and then his business taken away from him, and then his health began to decline. And as Job went to his friends, they all blamed Job. And even his wife got to the point where she said, maybe, Job, your life is not even worth living because it appears as though God has taken uh, action against you that is going to only lead to destruction. But God, in his plan, always designed to restore Job. But God was using Job as an example to the whole world of what restoration looks like. And the Bible reminds us that at the end of the story, God gave Job twice as much of what Job had as a restoration for what Job had gone through. Now, none of us wants to be Job. Nobody wants to go through health issues. Nobody wants to have children or family to die. 
Nobody wants to have a business go out or to lose our job. But those are just examples of how trouble can come. But if we stay faithful to God, God will restore us. Nobody wants to go through Job's troubles, but what God shows us through Job is that if we are faithful and if we are confident that yet even in trouble, we are still safe in his arms, God will restore us. Job speaks to us even today and says to us, when you have trouble come in your life, when you have calamity fall in your life, yes, God will restore you. And I hope that there are those out here listening who maybe you've gone through a situation where destruction has come into your life. Maybe you've lost your job and you're waiting for God to restore you. I say to you, keep your faith in God. Maybe you had a relationship to break up and you're waiting for God to restore your heart and to heal your heart. I say to you, yes, God will restore you. Maybe you've had a situation where maybe your car is broken down or maybe your home has been destroyed, particularly those who have gone through the tornado. I want you to be reminded God will restore you. God is faithful and God is just. You keep on trusting and believing in God and God will restore you. Don't let Satan come into you, your mind and cause you to stop trusting God. Remember that God has, has the ability to restore everybody that God comes in contact with. God has the faith in you to be faithful, but you got to keep trusting God. Look at the story of Ruth. Here she was, had gotten married. Here she was, was excited about her new marriage. And then her father-in-law dies. And the next thing she knows, her brother-in-law dies. And then her own husband dies. Here was Ruth without a father-in-law, without a brother-in-law, and without a husband. Where was she going to find any hope? She found hope in the God of her mother-in-law, Naomi. She found hope in the God of her uh, new mother-in-law. And she told her, your God will be my God and your people will be my people. Somewhere in that she found the hope to be restored. And the Bible tells us as she walked back to Naomi's home, as she walked back to Naomi's people, she found this man came named Boaz and she found the chance to love again. God restored her. God restored her love and God restored her hope. And that's just one example of how God can restore people. But God also restored a man named Peter. Peter, who God told, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. And Peter denied he knew Jesus. He denied that he was around Jesus. And he denied that he was even from the town that Jesus was in. But after the crucifixion, after Jesus died, and then after the resurrection, God went specifically to find Peter and he restored Peter. He said, Peter, I know that you've messed up. I know that you denied me, but I'm going to give you the chance to be restored. Well, that is good news for all of us because all of us from time to time have sinned. All of us from time to time have denied Jesus, but we have a chance to be restored because God is a God of restoration and God is a God of forgiveness. The restoration that God gave to humanity was found on the cross when Jesus died for all of our sins. But more than that, he specifically gives us the chance to be restored. So the next time that you happen to give into temptation, I don't want you to be down on yourself. I want you to be reminded that God can restore you, that God is waiting with his open arms to say to you, I know that you have sinned, but I still love you. I know that you have fallen by the wayside, but I still love you. I know that you denied me, but I still love you because he said to Peter, listen, do you love me more than these? Well, then go and feed my sheep. Do you love me more than this world? Well, don't, then go and guide my sheep. And so God is saying to all of us right now, somebody out there listening, you may think that God has forgotten about you. You may think that God has forsaken you. You may even think that your actions last night or last week or last month disqualifies you from God's love. But let me clear that up for you right now. God loves you and God wants to restore you. God has his arms open for you right now. And God is saying to you to come back home. God is saying to you, I can restore you. God is saying to you that he loves you. And I'm glad that God is doing that because God restored me also. God also restored you. God can pick you up from wherever you are and God can clean you up and God can set you on the right way. The woman at the well who's talking to Jesus learned it for herself. She tried to talk about all of her misdeeds. She tried to talk about her uh, former husbands, all of them. And Jesus said simply, I know all of your former husbands. I know all of your former relationships, but I'm not concerned about your past. I'm only concerned about your future. And I'm declaring to somebody who's watching today, God is only concerned about your future. He doesn't care about your past. He erased your past, past on Calvary's cross. He erased your past with his blood dripping down. 
He erased your past and he's coming out to restore you. God is coming out to restore your joy because somebody out there is sad this morning. Let God restore your joy. He's coming to restore your hope because somebody's head is bowed down. Let God restore your hope. He's coming to restore your faith because somebody has lost faith, not just in God, but also in themselves. Let God restore your faith. He's coming to restore your smile. He's coming to give you some more joy. Somebody is down because of your situation. And I say to you this morning, you need to thank God for the fact that you are still alive. Thank God for the fact you still have breath in your lungs. Thank God for the fact you still have the right to exercise your mind because that means that you can still have your hope restored. That means you can still have your faith restored. That means you can still have your smile restored. That means you can still have your joy restored. And I would implore you to thank God this morning for your life. Give God praise this morning for the fact you can breathe in and out. That blood is still running warm in your veins because that means you still have a chance to be restored. And maybe you don't need restoration, but maybe you know somebody who does. I want you to take this message to them and let them know that God restores. He is a God of restoration. He is a master carpenter. He is a master rebuilder. That God can come into any situation and build up our broken down lives. He is indeed the potter in whose hands is our clay. He is able, yes, to reshape and he is able to restore us. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I thank God this morning that God didn't give up on us. I thank God this morning that the Lord did not throw in the towel. I thank God this morning that God still had faith in us. I give God praise this morning, and I want you to praise God also. If there's anybody out there who knows that God has restored you, I want you to praise God right now. If there's anybody out there who knows that God made a way for you when there was no way to be made, I want you to praise God with me right now. I want you to thank God with me right now. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. I want you to thank the God that you serve for the fact that God didn't have to do it. God didn't have to come and rescue you. He didn't have to come and rescue me, but God loves us so much that he bent down on his knees and picked us up out of the miry clay and God dusted us off and God spin us around and God cleaned us up and God gave us a new walk in life. And I want you to praise God for what God did in your life. Only you know what you've been through. Only you know what God has done in your life. But I want you to praise God this morning because I want you to thank God for what he has done. I don't want you to miss this chance to praise God for what he's done. Let your spirit rejoice in what God has done for you because he is your heavenly father and you have been safe in his arms. He is your heavenly father and you will continue to be safe in his arms. But you got to remember that God loves you and don't let this world distract you from God's love. Don't let this world distract you from God's faithfulness. And I'm glad this morning that God loves us. I'm glad this morning that God took the time out to come and to save us. I'm glad this morning that somebody prayed for us, that somebody's grandmama and somebody's auntie and somebody's grandfather prayed for you and prayed for me and asked God to intervene in our lives. I'm glad that we had some godly examples in me and in our lives. I praise God this morning for the father that I had who showed me how to be a man. I praise God for Harold Love Sr. who showed me how to walk with my shoulders back and to lift my head high and to not let anybody get me depressed. I praise God for the fathers in your life that showed you how to have confidence, but more than that, showed you what love was and showed you what protection was. I praise God for the father figures in your life that showed you who God, our heavenly father was, showed you God's love. And I thank God this morning, and I want you to thank God also because their love still abounds. Their example still abounds. We are who we are today because of the father figures and the fathers in our lives. I would not be here today if it was not for my father pouring wisdom into my ears. I wouldn't be here today if my heavenly father hadn't blessed me this morning. And so I thank God this morning for his blessing. I thank God this morning for his love. And I thank God for his forgiveness. Amen, somebody. I thank the Lord for those things that he looked beyond. I thank the Lord for those thoughts of mine that he cast out. I thank God for his forgiveness. I thank the Lord for looking over my life and forgiving me. I don't know what you've been through, but I know what I've dealt with. I know the thoughts that I've had. And I thank God for ignoring those thoughts. And I thank 
God for blessing me. And so we rejoice today and we lift God's name. Oh God, we extol your name. God, we lift your name on high. Lord, we lift you up, God, because you have blessed us, God. You have been better to us, God, than we have been to ourselves. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings in our lives. We thank you, God, for being a heavenly father to wrap us in your arms and to keep us safe. I hope it's somebody out there who knows that God has been good to you. I hope there's somebody out there knows that God has indeed blessed your life. And you, I want you to give him praise this morning for what he has done. Amen. 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 The Bible says that God is our stronghold. And he is our stronghold in times of trouble. And God will rise up. And he will be there for us. And I hope that God's message has resonated with you this morning. I hope that it's reminded you of God's love and God's protection for you. There may be one out there now who is in need of a reminder of God's love. Won't you pray with us now? Gracious God, we thank you for intervening in our lives. We thank you, God, for being our Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for sending us examples of you in men that we can praise you for that showed us, God, how to live a righteous life. We bless your name, O oh God, for them in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. There may be somebody listening, God, who doesn't know you in the parting of their sins. And so we ask, oh God, that you would extend your hand to them. Show them, oh God, your love. Show them, oh God, the safety you can provide for them in your arms. Bless them now, oh God, as our prayer in your son, Jesus, the Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I hope that the message uh, has gone forth and blessed you. It certainly has blessed me as I reminded myself of, of God's love in my life. It is now time for our birthdays and our anniversaries. We're going to turn it over to uh, First Lady Leah Love for our birthdays and anniversaries and announcements. Good morning, Lee Chapel. It's now time for birthdays, anniversaries, and announcements. This week's birthdays include Moses Owens, June 22nd, Prentice Lyons, June 22nd, Michelle Flowers, June 24th, Mildred Woods, June 24th, Jerome Perry Jr., June 27th, and Kayla Statham, June 27th. We send you lots of love and virtual hugs today. Happy birthday. We also have a wedding anniversary. Keisha and Michael Davis, June 21st. Happy anniversary to a Lee Chapel couple. We have two ways to give. Mail to the church at 1200 Dr. D.B. Todd Jr. Boulevard, Nashville, Tennessee, 37208, or online at leechapel.org forward slash online giving. Join us for a Bible study every Wednesday on Facebook Live at 6.30 p.m. You can also join us for a weekly prayer call every Tuesday and Thursday morning at 10 a.m. The dial-in number and access code can be found on your screen. All right, we hope you'll be mindful of the announcements that were uh, just read for us. Certainly, we want you to join us for Bible study on Wednesday and for church school on this Saturday. And also, we will be getting more information to you about our re-entry plans uh, for in-church physical building worship. I've asked uh, the stewards to compile a committee to work on that. And so we're, we're talking about things like uh, going to phase three now in the city of Nashville, what it looks like for us to come back into worship. Uh, we have not set a date yet, but I assure you as we put plans together, we are taking every precaution we can. We will have masks available. We will have sanitizing stations available. And we'll have ourselves spaced out enough so that we'll be able to worship God and, and be also careful in our procedures. So be on the lookout for a message from us uh, via email about a date that we're going to plan. We don't have a date yet, but again, as our committee is working together, we want to praise God for them as they diligently plan to look at CDC guidelines, but also our guidance here in the city of Nashville for how we can effectively worship uh, and be safe and, and return uh, to God's house uh, in a manner I know some folks have asked if we can please keep the service as short uh, when we get back, but we'll look at that also uh, when we get into service, uh, when we get back together. So God bless you and God keep you is my prayer. And until next time, uh, may God continue to bless you and your family is my prayer. <laughs>